Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Y'all give another praise to the Lord for these guys. Amen. It's a great worship service today. Great music. Season of Thanksgiving. You need to be sure and tell these folks thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to remind you that uh, Wednesday night we'll be having church here at this particular campus, so you don't want to miss it. We're in our series. Uh, we're talking about Ahab and Jezebel. So I want to remind you to come be a part of that service. We're talking about Satan's strategic attacks on men and women. We talked for two weeks about Ahab and how Satan attacks a man. We used him as, a, as that uh, character example in Scripture. How uh, the enemy will de deceive a man, work in a man's life, and how important it is that you, uh, as a man, know those, you know, those techniques and devices of the enemy so that you don't fall into those kind of tragedies. Wednesday night is the section on Jezebel, so I want to encourage you to come be a part of it, ladies and men. It'll be a very enlightening time in the Word of God, so don't miss it. Uh, message today is, deliver me! <laughs> that kind of seems to be the theme of the music as well, amen? Break every chain. Deliver me. Uh, how many times have you cried that out before the Lord? It's, and what do we do when we have those critical moments in our life of just, you know, the, of just absolute despair? In Psalms 40, there is a psalm in regard to that. In the first three verses, what I want to look at today, three or four verses, and, and, and just see what, how the psalmist reacts in a moment of a personal crisis, in a moment of absolute despair. And I believe we all get to those times in our life where we just... Uh, don't know what to do when, when the walls seem to be caving in, when everything seems to be horrible. I mean, uh, we come to those places. Maybe you've been in those places recently. I know that in times in my own life and past, there's been those times where you just come to that place, and sometimes it's news from a doctor. Sometimes it's in a hospital waiting room. Sometimes it's maybe down at the jailhouse, you know. You, you just don't know. Maybe in the time of, of marital conflicts or problems with our, our children, it, it's natural for us to cry out in those times and deliver me. Lord God, deliver me. Set me free. Break these chains and show me what I need to do. And, uh, you know, there just seems to be those moments in life uh, you just need some kind of supernatural hand of God to just reach down and pick you up out of those situations. The world doesn't offer an answer like that. And too often we look in all the wrong places. Well, I want to talk about just very simply today from about three verses here in Psalms chapter 40 of what do we do in the critical moments of life. Look, look at what the psalmist says. Uh, he says, to, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me, and he heard my cry. He brought me also up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. He set my feet on a rock, and he established my goings. He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise to our God. And many will see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Man, this is such a, a tremendous psalm, and maybe you've not ever come to the place like I'm describing this morning. To have to come to this place where there's just not an answer. I, I've been in those places. I've sat with some of you when you've come to those times in your life. When you, it's like, I, 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 have the, I have no answers. I, the, what, what do I do? You feel like the absolute you know, breath has been completely knocked out of you. I, I know as a, as a father and as a husband and, and family situations, I, I've been in those times. I, I never forget one of those times in, in my life of just absolute feeling this I, I, I have helplessness. I remember my children were about, probably my daughter was about eight, and my son was about five, and Kathy had just experienced a third miscarriage. Sitting in my daughter's room in the little bed, and we're just kind of sitting on her little day bed in her room over here in Spring, Texas. And everybody's crying. And, you know, I don't have answers. And they're looking to me for answers. And nobody has answers, and the children are old enough to know, and they're just boo-hoo, and I mean, they're just wrecked. They were in such excitement about the new baby. Looking at my wife, who, third time miscarrying, wanting one more child at least. And just those moments where you just, you feel like the psalmist, I'm in a horrible place. I don't have any answers. This is a horrible pit. And again, I believe if you live long enough, you'll experience more than one of those pits in your life. Sometimes it's, it's losing somebody you, you absolutely have shared your life with. Sometimes it's in the midst of whether death or divorce or whatever. It's just, it, there's, God, there's no answer here. I, I don't know what to do in, in, in these kind of situations. A lot of people, they get those situations, and I, and I don't know how they handle it if they don't know Christ. If you don't know the Lord, how in the world do you deal with those kind of problems and those kind of situations that this sinful world is going to present you sooner or later? 
You're going, to, you're going to stand in those kind of places. Or just, I don't know what. When you see some glorious truth here, if you just take a moment to kind of meditate and ponder what, what is being said here, the psalmist is obviously in a place, and I'm going to describe this place as he describes it in just a moment. And you see what he did, and then you see what the Lord did. You, you realize that in, in situations like this, that this deliverance that comes is not just a one-sided single action on somebody's part here. There really are uh, two, two sides there. There's the psalmist, what he says he's doing. And then there's that part where you see what God is doing. And it's interesting to, to weigh these out. You'll see as you, you study it that the, obviously the part that you, know, that you do is not near what the Lord does ultimately. He says, I waited patiently. And sometimes I think that we have this idea that to wait patiently is just to kind of sit down and twirl our thumbs and just kind of bide time as it goes by the best that we can. It's really this, it's a unique word in Scripture when it says, I waited patiently for the Lord. It's the word in the Greek language, kava, and it literally means to, to eagerly wait for something, to linger, to kind of hold on for, you, you know an answer's coming. There's this, there's this attitude of expectation here. It's not that I'm just kind of, just kind of there's nothing else to do, I'm just going to sit here, and, oh, Lord, oh, oh, Lord, you know, just, and worry myself to death. No, this is an attitude uh, uh, of, uh, of, of, of deliberation, of, of, uh, of, of trust, of, of expectation. You, you really are looking to, to the Lord. Another psalmist, another psalmist says, I, I looked unto God uh, and I looked unto the mountain. Whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord. You know where your help comes from if you're, if you're in this position now. As a believer, you ought to realize that God is your only hope. Now, this is where I think the psalmist understands a little bit more than some others do because I waited patiently for who? For the Lord. Now, he didn't say I waited patiently for deliverance. Natural, normal, common human response when we find ourselves in a place like this is to first and foremost look for the doorway out. Deliverance. I'm waiting for God. He understands that if you wait for God, you get what you need. Deliverance is found in someone. Deliverance is found in the Lord. The answer comes from the Lord. Your answer today, if you're in one of these situations in your life, it's going to come from God. Now, often we think that, well, maybe I can finagle myself. You know, that's, that's a good Texas word, isn't it? Finagle. I can finagle myself. I can wiggle my way. I can, I can work my way. I can put, you know, the pieces together. I'm a smart guy. I figure this out. I can kind of come up with the answer if I just kind of hold on long enough. Man, I, I'll figure this out. Maybe if, if I can get help from mom or dad or, or uncle or aunt or whoever it might be or a friend and there's times when uncle, mom, dad, and friends just can't do anything. They don't have the answer and they don't have the money because the answer's not money. But somehow we, we, we get to a place where we're looking, longing, waiting, but it's not on the right source. And the right source is ultimately God himself. I waited patiently for the Lord. And this patient context is, in the, is the idea of an anticipation. I anticipate. I do believe God's going to do something here. My faith is in him. And literally, this is what this is all about. This is, this is, a, this is an act of faith. It's an act of, I, I'm believing God. I, I'm looking for help. By the way, I'm looking for real help. I don't need a temporary solution to my crisis. I don't want to be relieved today and wake up in the same hole again tomorrow. And boy, when he talks about I waited patiently for the Lord, I think there's the obvious understanding that he's talked to the Lord about it. All right? So this, 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 this whole idea of, of seeking the Lord and, and looking to God, is, is a, it, it requires not just the words that come out of your mouth. There's this, there's this, this, this mind, will, body, soul. I mean, it's, your, it's the entirety of your being that's, that's turning to God in this situation. I'm waiting for you, God. Now, that's all there is to it. Because you can't do anything. You can't change these kind of situations. You can't... Rub it and make it better and kiss it and make it better and pat it on the head and make it better. It's a bad deal. I waited patiently for the Lord. Now, that's the start. That's where we come to, and sometimes that's a war itself in getting to that place, is it not? Because sometimes we just, you know, it's our, it's our first recourse many times to worry and to dread and to experience fear in life. He said, no, but I waited patiently for the Lord. And listen, to, now that's our part. One thing. But the Lord's part, when you look right here, there's about five things that God's doing in this, in this regard. And by the way, coincidentally, or God incidentally, five is the number in Scripture for grace. 
And that we serve a God of grace. And God is a great God of grace. And God, in His grace, is present. And God, in His grace, does these things that we, we go through. And, I, and I've listed five that from the psalm. First of all, it says, He inclined His ear to me. Obviously, again, the, there was this action upon the psalmist's part that he's looking to God, he's praying, and he, he, there's this anticipation, that's what patiently waiting is, an anticipation that God's going to answer. And so he's, he's, he's like that, that person who just stands there ready for God to do what he says he promises to do in the Word of God. So waiting never literally means I'm just going to sit by. There's this attitude of faith. I'm looking to God. Look at what the Isaiah 40 verse 31 says. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run. They shall not be weary. They shall walk. They shall not faint. Well, there's some great things that God does. But I, the key to all that is there's this patient waiting upon the Lord. In fact, the word wait there in Isaiah has, is a word which has to do uh, with, uh, it is sometimes even translated with writhing. Another time it's translated to dance about. What does that mean? Have you ever seen a little kid that's just waiting, you promise something, and just... They're just, you know, it's, it's almost like they're dancing, they're ready, they're, let's go, are you ready now, can we get in the car, that kind of attitude. That's what waiting is, that, that's what biblical waiting is. It's not just kind of, oh, I'll just sit down and be sorrowful and pray and worry on my knees. It's completely different. I'm waiting, and what does God do? And this is beautiful, and excuse the, 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 the terminology here, but I can't think of any other way when it says, He inclined His ear to me. And the idea of this word within the, the language of the Hebrews is, is a parent who would bend forward to hear what his child is so anxious about and wanting to hear about. It's not the idea of the parent who's got a thousand things going on because we can be like that so many times, Amen. But all of a sudden, we hear a, a certain tone in our child's voice, and boom, we're right there. And we, we're bending over to hear what's going on. This is the word that's being used. There's this, there's this, there's this bending forward as, to, as a parent to a child to, just to hear what the, the absolute need of this child is, to hear, to be, to, 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 to be heard on your part, but to, for God to take the action to be the hearer is glorious. God, God's attending. And God's not like that busy parent who's got a thousand things going on and can't do but a few at a time. God can do it all, all the time. And some people say, well, I don't want to bother God. <laughs> You're not going to bother God, all right? He's not got a one-track mind. He is omniscient, omnipotent, all right? He can deal with it. Nothing's too big for him. And if everybody in the world is seeking an answer at the same time, it's still not too big for him. All right? He's God. He's not like a man. He doesn't respond like a man. And God is a God, this is the beautiful thing about it, you can talk about what's beautiful, it's kind of, He is the parent. He is the Father. He is hearing. He's concerned about your situation. He cares about you. And I know sometimes we, we listen to the voice of, of the enemy who whispers stuff like, well, God doesn't care, and God doesn't notice, and if God really loved you, you have to, you have to file all that stuff in the garbage can. It's a mental war sometimes we go through. You literally bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ Jesus, as Paul told the Corinthians. Well, you capture those thoughts and you say, hey, God, I thank you that you hear my cry. You hear. And I'm, I'm, I'm in a position now to expectantly wait for you to respond. First thing he does is incline. Then it says, then he responds with action. He's heard now. He says what he does. He brings me up out of a horrible pit and out of a miry clay. Literally, it's to be brought up. It is like to draw something up out of a well, to, to bring it up. In fact, that's, that's exactly the picture he's given. I'm in a pit. The pit is the idea of, remember when Joseph was sold into slavery? Uh, they put him in a pit first. They were just going to leave him in a pit and tell Dad, you know, the lions killed him. And eventually, you know, put some blood on his robe and gave it back to Dad. But they put him in a pit. It was a well, it was a cistern. What they would do in the Mideast, and there's these, there are these big in-ground cisterns that they would hold that would capture the rainwater during the rainy seasons, and the water would be poured off and funneled into these, these pits, all right? If you've ever been to the Middle East with us, the old, they'd have discovered in the, in, the, in the garden area where the tomb of Jesus was a big cistern like this, all right? And there was this big cistern, and the way it's designed, it, it's set up, this, this pit is to be like a, a, a bell-shaped pit with slick walls, there's, there's no way out. But what, what I mean by bell shape is that the narrow part of the bell is at the top where the hole is, and <clears throat> the water would go down 
or if you wanted to capture somebody, you would lower them down into this pit. And because the walls are shaped like a bell, you, you can't climb out, all right? It's impossible. It, it's, it's a deep pit. This is, this is the pit that it's talking about. It, 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 again, in those trips to Israel, if those of you who've been there and perhaps you, you visited Caiaphas' palace, you remember that there had to be some place because they arrested Jesus in the nighttime, there had to be some place that after the trial before the Sanhedrin that they held Jesus, probably for hours before they could take him to the Roman Praetorium to stand before you know, Pontius Pilate because the courts and, the, the, and Pilate were not available. And so they had to wait until the morning hours, so they held him. Psalms 22, I believe it is, and talks about a pit. This is, this, is, this is what we're talking about. You, you would visit and go down to that pit. Now they've got a stairwell leading down into it. But when you get in there, it's, it's like this bell shape kind of to it going up. And it closes in. So there's just no way to crawl out of this kind of pit. It's just not going to happen. He says, the Lord brought me up out of the pit. The idea is of desperation. Isolation. It's like being out in the middle of the Pacific or the Atlantic in a tiny raft with no provisions and no help in sight. There's no way to be saved. There's no way in the, in the, in the ways and the means of man this is going to be all, ever, all right. I was in this kind of pit, he says, and the Lord brought me up out. and literally means to deliver up like a bucket in a well. In this moment of de desperation, God reaches down and he lifts him up and delivers him. And he begins to move in mercy and grace. And you see what he does here. But he describes this pit as a horrible pit. You know, I was in this pit. It was a horrible pit. A horrible means it is a word which a lot of times is translated having to do with noise. Like a loud, roaring noise. Like, like Niagara Falls, you know. There's this roar that's to it. And it's a, it's a grinding noise. And the idea is I'm in this pit and it, it is grinding me down like powder. It's painful. It's miserable. It's like roaring all day and all night. There's just no way out of this. And in fact, he says, I was in the pit, and of course, in the pit is the bottom of the pit where the miry clay is. I don't know if you've ever been stuck out in some of this good old red clay of East Texas before or not. That's nasty stuff. I've gotten a car stuck in that kind of stuff on the side roads, out on ranch roads and stuff before. And it's even worse when you try to get the car out, it just kind of digs down and sinks down into it. And then when you try to get out and you try to put it, you just kind of sink down into it. In fact, it's so nasty when you stick your feet down in it, it's like it pull your foot up and wants to suck your shoes off. And this is, this is miry clay. It, it's, 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 it makes you immobile. It, it's like, you know, trying to run in chest deep water. You're just not getting anywhere. You're spending a lot of energy and you're do, having a lot of effort, but nothing is happening here. It's miry. And what happens in these situations is our heart is filled with dread. It's filled with fears. They begin to cloud our mind. It's, doubt comes in. And this is where we need to remember that waiting on the Lord is the most important. I, I'm not waiting on any other thing than God to be God in this situation. I need God. And he delivered me, he says, out of this pit. He brings me up out of that miry clay. And the third thing he does in this context, and he set my feet upon a rock. By the way, this is a word for like a craggy rock where there's a, a fortress that's almost impenetrable because it's set on the side of a mountain. You can't, you can't climb up hardly. It's like the cleft of the rock that the scripture says in Moses. This is the same word that's used there in the Old Testament. Moses was hidden in the cleft of the rock. It's like the old hymn song says, you know, he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. This is what God does for us. We come from the place of fear. He lifts us out of the place of no answers. He lifts us out of the place of darkness and despair. He puts hope in our heart because he lifts us up and he sets us out upon a rock. It's a fortress. Boy, how often do you see where the psalmist is using that kind of uh, picture to demonstrate the security and the protection that, that God provides, that, that he sets us out and puts our feet and provides for us not only security, but firmness and stability. He set my feet upon a rock. The fourth thing he says, and he established my goings. Go ahead and click that for me one time. It's not working here. He established my goings. Now basically the idea here is that God sets him out, puts him on this rock, he establishes his going, and the idea, thank you, the idea here is that uh, it's like a parent who tells a child exactly where to walk. That's the idea for goings and someone establishing my goings. In other words, God not only brought me out, he's going to show me how to walk and move forward. Where should I step and where should I stand? 
So the idea here is, I have some, a new direction, and it's, it's a direction that's under the leadership of the Holy Spirit in my life. That I'm under the, the guidance and the care and the protection and the security now of God's leadership and God's Holy Spirit that's working in my life. So now I know not only that I'm standing, I know where I'm walking. I know the course I'm supposed to take. And so often people get out of the miry clay and they don't look for the new path. They just start going back to the same old things they were doing. And pretty soon they went to end up in some other pit of some other making and some other kind. And because they didn't follow the, the firm and established and stable path that the Lord was providing for them. So here's the idea that he brings me up and then he gives me this firm foundation to stand on. And then he shows me how to walk. In fact, the word for goings here is a, is a Hebrew word meaning a right direction, a straight direction. It literally translates the blessed or the happy direction. This is what God does. In response to my despair, now I have hope. In response to the, no direction, no life, no light, now I have a path. Now I have a plan. Now I have purpose. And God's the only one who can do that in these kind of situations, really, because answers that we really need for the heart of man are not found in the world. They're found in the heart of God. So he says, the Lord, he brings me up. He sets me on a rock. He establishes my going. And he puts me on a path that's the right direction. So the whole context of this is that not only is God doing something in this corrective fashion in my life, he's doing something for the moment in my life, but he's also doing something for the rest of the moments in my life. That out of this pit, there's a course that I can take. That out of this, I can learn something. Out of this, I might even grow in some regard. Out of this, I discover the supernatural resources that God provides for my life. And how few Christians, and I hate to say this, folks, but how few Christians ever really discover the supernatural resources that God has for their life. That God is a fount of blessing. That God is a firm foundation. That God is a source of strength that God is the joy instead of the despair that the world knows. God is so much more. He does what? He establishes my going. Now the fifth thing here that he does, is, 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 you don't miss, don't miss the context of this. He says he has put now a new song in my mouth. Now something's gone on in my life, and now my life can't contain it. It's coming out of my mouth. Well, we, we know, scriptures teach, and life itself teaches us that whatever's filling our heart and our mind is what's filling our mouth. So what's coming out your mouth is what's in your heart. But God's done a work now in the heart. So guess what's coming out the mouth? It's this new song. It's a fresh song. It's the word new here. It's a song of revival. It's a song of restoration. It's a song of renewal. I've experienced God on some fresh and new, great and glorious dimension in my life. It is a song literally of grace and glory. It has an effect upon me. But if you follow the course of Psalms, it not only this song, it's just, it's a, it's a echo of what God's doing in my heart. It has an effect on other people as well. The new song begins to work in people's hearts and lives because for first it starts here, it's in my mouth and it's a song of praise. It's a song of recognition of what God's done. It's a song of blessing to God for all that he's done. And it's something that I cannot contain. It's in my mouth. Therefore, it means it's spoken. Amen. It is so important. For you as a Christian to learn how to communicate to other people what God is doing in your life. This should be from the very first day you meet Jesus to the rest of your life. When you tell people what Christ has done in saving you and delivering you and setting you free. Why is that so important? Because other people are in a pit. Other people are in bondage. Other people are in trouble. And God wants our life to echo His grace, not only for what He in gratitude for what He's done for us, but out it comes so it makes a difference, and it's a confession that it makes a difference in other people's lives as well. It's a new song, and it's sung, and it's said, and it's repeated because it's genuine. It's a real Word of God. It will be shared, He says, and many will see it. In other words, it's not a secret. You know the old song, it is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. Well, the idea, folks, here is that faith comes by hearing. <laughs> so you're letting it be heard. 
How many people around you today would be saved if you just opened your mouth? It probably would stagger you because you've believed a lie many times that we've been sold this bill of goods, uh, separation of church and state. And so we apply that to our life. Let's don't keep God out in the public. Let's keep God in private. When this whole thing about Christianity is, is private first, but it becomes public quickly. Amen. Amen. It's amazing. We've got all these people calling about gays coming out of the closet. It's time for Christians to come out of the closet. Amen. And let their light shine and be heard and be vocal and be verbal. Amen. You can praise the Lord for that. That's a fact that needs to be discovered. Listen, how many people around you are hurting? And how many people are in a pit? They're doing a very good job of disguising it. You know, they're, they've covered it up real well. Nobody knows they're in a pit. And they're, they'd be embarrassed if anybody knew they're in a pit. Listen, everybody gets in a pit. Live with it. Get over it. There's pits that we go through. And God wants people to be delivered and God wants people to be lifted up and drawn out and set in security and set on a new path and put a song in their heart. But it starts with me being willing to open up my heart. And if I will do that, it does have an effect on other people's lives. It's biblical. It's the power of the living word of God. The Bible says the gospel, this glorious message of God's deliverance, the gospel message is alive and it's able to change the hearts and the minds of people. In fact, the Bible says it's the power of God unto salvation. What is? The gospel. So when I start singing this new song, guess what happens? God takes his power through those words that I'm saying and begins to break down the barriers of doubt in people's hearts and in people's minds. There's an amazing power, an amazing grace, an amazing glory in the words that you share with other people's lives. Quit sitting on what God's done. Start singing it. Start speaking it. Let others know what God's doing. People are looking for answers. We're living in desperate days and people don't have answers. You know, it's amazing, especially I think the day we're living in, I've been listening to the news like every one of you have, and all the news is talking about the fiscal cliff. Anybody heard about the fiscal cliff? We're going to go off the fiscal cliff on January 1st. Listen, we went off the fiscal cliff 10 years ago. We just hadn't realized it yet. Amen. It's just now starting to catch up. Gravity's going into play. But hey, if things get worse, there's going to be a whole lot more people in pits than they ever realized before. But who is God going to use? Who's God going to, who's God going to put his hand upon? It's going to be those people who've been through the pit, in the pit, and out of the pit. Amen? And experience the grace of God in their life. I encourage you to be that person who opens their mouth, who's willing to let other people know what God's doing. Now, there's always two responses. I love it when people come up and say, man, let me tell you what God's doing in my life. Unless I'm not really right with God myself. Then I'll sit and smile and say, yeah, just tell me, oh, it's just wonderful, brother. God bless you. I'm thinking, would you just shut up? <laughs> That's our natural response from our flesh, and we're backslidden, amen? But what happens? There are those people out there who are not in that position, who are in a pit, who want to hear how to get out. They want to hear what God did in your situation. They want to know that there is hope, that there is an answer, that there is a way. You are the means. You're the method that God has chosen. Let the new song be heard. And it says it will have an effect. In fact, it says many will see it. The idea is I'm not keeping this a secret when God delivers me. I'm going to let folks know about it. I'm not keeping this a secret when God comes through and gives grace in the midst of grief. I want people to know that God's able. I'm not keeping a secret when God comes through in the midst of my darkest hours and light comes pouring in and he gives a peace that passes all understanding. Many need to hear about it because there's a lot of people in the same situation. Many will hear it, it says, and it will cause something to happen in their heart. It says, and they will fear. In other words, it's the respect for God that comes all and an awe of God to see what God has done in a real, physical, personal way. They all of a sudden see that God is not some being sitting on the other side of the universe, on the other side of the cosmos, in some distant region where maybe occasionally one prayer might get through because you're a good enough person. They want to know that there's a God of grace who forgives in the midst of your greatest failures and still loves you and still will redeem you and save you. Many will see it, and they'll have a respect for God. I've had people come and say, you know, Brother Joe, you know, you need to come talk to my friends, you know, like I'm some intellect. You know, I've got these atheist friends of mine, and they just don't believe the Bible, and they got all these questions. I say, you know what you need to do with your friends? You need to find the newest newborn believer you can find. 
You take that new Christian and you sit in the midst of all those intellects and let them bombard him with their questions and all he's going to say, hey, I just don't know. I was blind, but now I see. I was lost, but now I'm found. Hallelujah. They don't have an answer for that. Well, what do you do about it? They don't have an answer. God moves in real, practical. I can see this, touch this, taste this, feel this. This is genuine. This is God. There's no answer for that. That's what you do. Never let the enemy talk you out of sharing what God is doing. If there's something fresh and new God's doing in your life, if he's delivered you in any form, any fashion, listen, share it. And it says, and they will trust God. There's a lot of people. Every one of you are in this room today that are trusting God in your life because somebody had the courage in the time of your trial to share truth with you. And you trusted God. You trusted God. You believe what God had to say. Ultimately, this is a prophetic psalm of Jesus. He went down into the, the pit of death for us. God drew him up out on the third day. And because of that, there is a new song that is now the song of the gospel. It's the song of redemption. And anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord, God will hear it. This is the basis of this psalm. First and foremost, prophetically, theologically, doctrinally, this is a prophetic psalm of the great grace of God in sending his son and allowing him to be Lord like it was that prophetic picture of Joseph's brothers luring him into that pit, being sold into bondage. Jesus came and took up on the form of a servant and a slave and ultimately the form of man becoming sin for us who knew no sin, that you and I might be made the righteousness of God. He was lured into the pit of death and the grave. On the third day, the Bible says God drew him up. He raised him up and has given him a name above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's our testimony. This psalm should be our song. Anytime you've experienced a pit in your life, if you've been through those and you've seen the glorious hand of God, this is your psalm. This is your song. Sing it and let others find revival. Let others find life. Let others find deliverance. This is a great psalm, but it's absolutely of no effect if we don't realize the, the, the grace of God in our lives. How many times have you been there to this place in your life? And you've seen God move. I've, I've sat with many of you. You know, the, one of the privileges about pastoring a church for 25 years is that you get to walk through these places, be in these pits, so to say, go through these valleys of the shadow of death, and come out the other side and see what God does in people's lives and see the lights come on. In the midst of what would seem like absolute darkness, God's mercy unfold like a flower before him. Watch what God does in hearts and lives. You know this is true. If you find yourself in a pit today, quit complaining. Get those eyes from looking down to looking up. Begin now not to wait with some expectation on freedom or deliverance. Begin now to wait and have an expectation of God. Looking to him. He is the answer. You're not going to really get any answer that means anything apart from him. What's he say? I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined his ear unto me. And he drew me up out of the horrible pit and out of the miry clay. And he set my feet upon a rock. And he hath put a new song in my heart. And many shall hear it and fear and trust the Lord. Would you stand with your heads bowed?